think of big O and little o, I go back to the definition. What are they supposed to mean? Um, to me, it means the following, OK? When we say that um, g sub n is equal to big O of, a, of f of, a, of n, let's say, what does that mean? That means that g is less than or equal to this side, right? means that it grows slower than this, or maybe the same. Does that, everyone agree that's what big O means? And when we say that it is um, omega of n, what we're really meaning is that it grows faster than that, right? Greater than or equal to that. That's what I interpret it as meaning, right? And when we say it is equal to theta of n, it means that it's growing exactly equal to that, right? Theta of n means we know tight up and upper and lower bounds. We've got the we're in the right neighborhood, right? This one says that we are um, above what we need. We know we're at least as above or equal to. Here we are, below or equal to. Here it is equal to. When we say little o, what do we mean? Little o, g sub n is little o of n, means that it is growing strictly slower than this. That it's not only less than or equal to this, but it is less than this. So what does that mean? That means less than in a big O sense. So what functions are little o of n? Can anyone give me a function little o of n? Function that grows slower than n. Yeah? One is growing slower than n. It doesn't grow, right? It's dead. It's like a flat pulse, okay? Somebody who's growing and getting bigger, but is growing slower than n. What would be one of those, yes? Log n is growing slower than n, right? What else is strictly growing slower than n? You think of something bigger than log n that is growing slower than n, yes? What? Radical n, you mean square root of n. Square root of n is growing slower than n, right? Can someone think of something bigger that is growing slower than n? Still going to get beaten up every bit as badly, but is bigger, grows faster than square root n, yes. n to the point 99999 is little o of n, right? Because o of n, it's n to the 1, right? What is not little o of n? Yeah? N to the 1.001, .001, yes, but that's for the big O. What separates the big O from the little O? N over 2 is not little O of N. Does everybody see that N over 2 would be big O of N, right? But it is not little O of N. They're in the same, it's, it's not less than or equal to. It's not less than, it's less than or equal to, okay? That's what the difference is. Any questions about that? OK. Any questions? OK, good. Any other questions about the homework or life? Yes, question. Yeah? OK, so it has to do, that problem, I believe, has to do with how do you sort things using stacks. And it's a question of what are you given access to, OK? If we are assuming then, suppose I give you the only memory you have are stacks. You're not allowed to use anything else. There are certain things you can do on a stack and certain things, certain things you can't do, OK? For example, what is something you couldn't do if all your memory was a stack? I claim you couldn't figure out which is the largest element on a stack, or the second largest, let's say. Why? Because somehow you've got to compare it to something, right? And how are you comparing two things when everything is a stack? You only have access to the top element, right? So the question there is if I give you a couple of stacks and I give you one extra variable, can you do it? Is that what the, what the question say? It said, you're given 
stacks, meaning you can push and pop and maybe look at the top. And you're given a variable where you can store something. The question of whether you're given vari single variables where you can store contents from the stack gives you more power potentially. And that's what that's getting at. Any questions? OK, any other questions about the homework or anything like that? OK, um, good. So what I'd like to do is to now, um, last class, we started talking about um, hashing. And I wanted to give a quick, um, oh, before, before, I guess before we've got to do our problems of the day. Our problems of the day related to, again, dictionaries and dynamic sets. And again, we had the six fundamental operations we could do in a dictionary. We could search for a key, insert an element, delete something given a pointer to it. We could find the minimum or maximum element. We could find the next element order after our, uh, uh, the element pointed to something, or the previous one. Those were the operations we said we could do. The, um, problem of the day says that we are given a dictionary implementation. Somebody else wrote it. They're told that it uses balanced binary search trees, right? So if so, it means that we can do all of these operations in log n time. Question is, if I know that I have a dictionary, let's say somebody gives me a dictionary implementation where they let me use these operations are implemented and take log n time each. Is it possible for me to use this dictionary to sort things in n log n time? So my question now is, how could you use a dictionary where you just have access to minimum, successor, insert, and search in order to um, sort a bunch of things? Someone give me an idea. The way that you would do it, I think, is to write a program that uses these operations, okay, as the, you know, and basically such that we know that it comes out sorted and we can analyze that program as n log n. What ideas, what, would, what, what procedure could we use if we have minimum successor search and insert? How might we be able to sort? Yes. So you're saying for i equals 1 to n, insert, um, you know, the next element, you know, uh, insert, el um, you know, element i. Okay? So we've done insertions, right? And insertions. What's the next thing we're going to do? So we say m is equal to minimum of s. Find the minimum element, right? And now what are we going to do? For i equals 1, 2, n minus 1, or until the end, what are we basically doing? Print m, and then find m is equal to the successor of m. Does everybody agree that? people see what the program is? You probably can't see it because you can't read my writing, but the writing is for me, not you. OK? What does it say? Insert everything into the dictionary. OK? How much time will it take to insert the n things into the dictionary? n things, each of which takes n log n. Does everybody agree that? Once we do it, we find the minimum element. OK? How much time does that take? Log n. Now, n times, we're going to go print out what the minimum element is, which is, I guess, the one in last order. That's going to be, if we want it from, from smallest to biggest. We find the minimum element. We print it out. Then we go and find the successor to it, right? And then we're going to print it out, pop, 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 till we're done. Does everybody see that? So how much time is this going to take? The last part? We have n steps, which takes how long? That's another n log n. So what is n log n plus n log n plus log n? n log n. Does everybody see how we have used the data dictionary data structure 
to sort an n log n time. Yes. Why is it n log n to insert things? We are told we are using a dictionary here. We are told here we have a dictionary that is capable of doing insertions in log n time. This is the guarantee that we get from this dictionary. Somebody gives you a different dictionary that doesn't offer these guarantees, then it would be different, right? But see what the convenience of thinking in terms of these dictionaries, knowing binary trees are good dictionaries. The best, let's say, worst case dictionaries are balanced binary trees. I can now think algorithmically about using these things, OK? And boom, I can sort using those operations. And my sorting algorithm, Skeena sort, takes n log n time, OK? And it just falls out of the property of using the data structure. Any questions? OK? Let's look at another, another part. OK, now I'm given a dictionary that has the following operations are fast. Minimum, insert, delete, and search. How could I actually um, sort using these things? OK, which ones did I have before that I don't have now? Successor, I don't have a successor anymore, right? What would be the thing that I could do? How could I use these things to sort? What do I have to do? What? You're saying getting the minimum and delete. OK? Do we agree that if I say 4i equals 1 to n, insert? Now I build my data structure, right? Now what you're saying is find the minimum, m is equal to the minimum item. Delete, print, M. And then you want to say delete M. You see what the basic iteration is? In each iteration, we find the minimum guy left in the tree. We print it out. It's got to be the first one, right? Then we, we delete it. And what's going to happen after we delete it when we call minimum again? Are we going to get the same element? No, because if we're getting the min of what's left, the min of what's left is next in sorted order. Does everybody agree with that? So this is another way we can sort using this. And what's the time complexity? How much time did it take to build that tray? n log n. Now I've got n things. What is the time complexity of this? It is n times. What am I doing? I'm doing a min, which takes log n, a print, which takes 1, and a delete, which takes log n. Does everybody agree with that? What is log n plus 1 plus log n? Log n. So the time of this thing is n log n. Does everybody agree with that? The first part takes n log n. The second part takes n log n. This algorithm sorts in n log n time given the dictionary. Any questions about that? What about another one? How can I sort in n log n time using only where all I've got is in or insert in order traversal? This one maybe is easy. I we didn't really talk too much about in order traversal, but I think you know what that is, actually. Or how many of you know what in order traversal is from your previous class? And how many people have never heard of it? OK. No one admits to never having heard of it. OK? So what would we do? 4i equals 1 to n. Insert. Build the tree in order n log n time, right? Then what are we going to do? We're going to do in order traversal of the tree. This is my tree. What am I going to do? I'm going to go bop, bop, bop. Print it out. Back up. Print it out. Print it out. Bop, bop. Print it out. Print it out. Print it out, right? That's what an in order traversal will do. And it will print it in, in, um, in, in order. What's the time it takes to do an in order traversal of a tree with n elements? 
This is order n. This is actually kind of interesting. Why is it order n? What do we do in this thing? We basically say e it's an inner loop where at each call it says, look to the left, print out the guy, and look to the right. Does everybody remember that's what in order traversal looks like? It's clear it takes constant amount of work per call, right? Because you know, it's constant amount of time to print. And then we look to the left. There's a total of n calls. n constant is n. Everybody you see that? So this algorithm is n log n plus n. What is the complexity of a total? n log n. So see how we have three different n log n sorting algorithms magically following from our dictionary. Which of these is best? Anybody, which of these is the best one, the fastest one? OK. To me, it beats me. I have no idea. There are three algorithms. They're all n log n. They are the same to me, right? So more than that, I, 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 I can't analyze, OK? But boom, we banged out three n log n algorithms for sorting using the dictionary. This is the power of the binary tree data structure. Once I have it, I can pull it out. And I didn't have to use anything about balancing. I didn't have to know anything about uh, how the you know, ABL trees, what was a left, or, or red black trees, what was red, what was black, or two three trees, what is two and what is three. These details I don't need to know, right? Once the, I know that the tree structure exists, boom, I can use it. And I can design algorithms using it. Any questions? OK, any questions about this problem of the day? OK, so what I would like to do now is um, talk about hashing again. We started talking about hashing at the end of the day. And on one sense, hashing and hash tables are an easy idea. On the other end, they're an idea that is more subtle than it might at first seem, and also much more powerful than it might seem. Okay. So um, we talked about hash tables, OK? We talked about hash tables as you know, a, the basic idea of a hash table is that we will take a key, an input key, schema, compute a function f of schema. It's going to be an integer between 1 and the size of my hash table. That will give me a bucket where we would put schema in, right? We will now maintain essentially a list of elements that have that same hash co code. Now, how do you insert somebody into a hash table? You compute h of the element you want, go to that bucket, add it to the linked list. It's in the table. How do you search for something in the hash table? In the hash, ta in the hash table. How do we do it? We compute the hash code of what we're looking for. Then cruise the linked list of elements that share that bucket, that the, the elements in that bucket. All of these guys have the same hash code. They may be Skeena, they may not be Skeena, right? How do you tell? Are you Skeena? No, I'm someone else with this hash code, thank you. Are you Skeena? No, I'm someone else with this hash code. Are you? Yes, I'm Skeena. OK, now you have found Skeena in the hash code table. Any questions? How do you delete somebody from the hash table? What do you have to do to delete Skeena from the hash table? You find Skeena, go down, hash on Skeena to find the um, right bucket. See if Skeena is ever given a pointer to it, the element in the list. Now it's just a question of deleting the guy from the list, right? The magic of the hash table is that if I do a good job spreading these elements around, OK, the hash table. If I have n buckets and n items to insert into this thing, what is the average number of items in each bucket? One. Does everybody agree? It? Is it hard to search a list of one element? No, that's fast, right? It takes constant time. So if I have a hash table approximately the si size of my number of elements, same order of magnitude as my number of elements, and if my hash function scrambles the keys around fairly uniformly. It should be the case there's only a small number of elements in any bucket, right? Ideally, a constant number of elements in any bucket. And if so, then I should be able to 
Insert, delete, and search in constant time. Okay, on average, if I'm lucky. Okay, any questions? So this is why hash tables are great things. Before we were talking log n, now we are talking constant. Okay, any questions? So what are the issues with hash tables that are, that are uh, worth noting? Again, we talked last class, I had um, started to talk to you about the, the key to making a hash function work, a hash table work, is having a good hash function. What is a hash function? Something that takes your input, your key, and computes a number from it. My favorite hash function is to interpret the string, as I started to say last time, as a base alphabet size. If alpha is the size of my alphabet size, if alpha is the size of the alphabet of my string, I want to interpret it, each string, as a base alpha number. Okay? Suppose my string was a binary string. Okay, here's a binary string. I live in a binary alphabet. What number is this number in binary? You're saying, I know that. This first digit here is in the, we are the ones column, right? The second digit is the twos column. The fours column, the eights, sixteens, thirty twos, sixty fours. What is this number in base two? Sixty four plus sixteen plus eight plus two plus one. Everybody agree with that? That's how you interpret a binary number. Nothing mysterious about that, right? How do you interpret a base 128 number? What is a base 128 number? Well, it could be an example of that might be 64. Here's uh, 107, 3, right? This number is multiplied by... One, the second number is going to get multiplied by 128 to the one. The next column gets multiplied by 128 to the two. Does everybody agree that's what a base 128 number looks like? Where does the one come from for the last column, by the way? 128 to the zero, right? So I claim one way I can convert any key string to a number is by interpreting it as a base one base alphabet size number. And this gives me a number that is unique for any given string. Does everybody agree with that? So what is the problem with using that as a hash code? Collision, the answer is no collisions. Every string is getting a different number. If we've assigned what this is kind of interesting, if we believe this, We've just done is map all the strings you can possibly make, okay, to unique numbers, right? I've assigned a number to a new a string, okay? Actually, there's a joke about that. Let me see if I can remember this. This might be embarrassing. You ever hear the one about the prisoners who have been together telling jokes for many, many years? A group of prisoners got together, they've been telling jokes to each other, they've been in the prison, they're in the life, life terms, right? They're there forever. So instead of telling jokes, by now, they've memorized the number associated with stroke. Each joke has a number associated with it, right? Why did the chicken cross the road? That's 172, OK? So a new prisoner comes to the, comes to the cell block. And he sits in, and prisoners are sitting around. One of them yells out, 1,096. Wah, wah, wah. Everyone starts to laugh. 1,072. Wah, wah, wah. Prisoner doesn't know what's going on, but he wants to join the in crowd, right? So he yells out, 25. Dead silence. The other guys start shaking their heads. Some guys don't know how to tell a joke. OK? What's the point of that? I may not be able to tell a joke. But what that, the reason why that joke is funny is there is a mapping there between numbers and strings, right? Does everybody see that? So with this scheme, we have unmapping between numbers and strings, OK? So in principle, if these strings were jokes, you would know whether to laugh when you heard the number, right? But that is not really a complete hash function. What is it that I am missing? What is bad about those numbers that I have generated? They are very big, right? If we wanted to build a, use a hash table like this, we need to have a number 
I have as many elements as there are um, no, s strings in the universe, right? So what we need to do now is to take this big number and map it to a little number, okay? What is the obvious way to take a big number and map it to a little number? Mod, right? What if we take x? And we take x mod n. What do we get after that? The mod operation is the remainder when we divide it by n. Does everybody remember that, right? What's the biggest number we can get after x mod n? n minus 1. What's the smallest one? Every, we got all the integers in between as possibilities, right? So the good thing is this now gives us an index number between 0 and n. This is, this is a good hash number function, potentially, if we have n elements in our hash table. Does everybody agree with that? Now, why does doing the mod do a good job of cutting this number down? Okay, and what we want is not only that we cut it down, but we cut it down in a way that all the elements of the hash table are equally likely to be used, right? One way you could cut it down is to take the number and say it's one. Okay, whatever number you give me, it's one. Okay, now it's smaller, but what would be bad is everybody gets thrown into bucket one. Does everybody see that? Why intuitively is taking the mod of a big number a good way to make it uniform, okay? And I'll offer you an analogy, okay? The analogy of a roulette wheel. Has anybody ever been to a casino or seen a roulette wheel, right? A roulette wheel, what is a roulette wheel? It's a device for picking numbers between zero and, uh, and 35, I th 36, I think, right? Do roulette wheels select numbers uniformly? They'd better or else people wouldn't bet on them funny, right? So we trust roulette wheels to give us random numbers, right? If, 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 unless the casino's cheating, right? What is the idea? Why do we trust that? Well, what do you do? You take the ball and you run it around and around and around around the wheel. Isn't that what the dealer does? They throw the ball on the outside of the wheel. Around and around and around and around and around. Ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk when it loses energy, right? And it falls into a bucket. Isn't what a roulette wheel really doing is taking the length of the distance that the ball is traveling and modding it by the length of the wheel, the circumference of the wheel. Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that an interpretation of what it is doing? And how people get they get this idea? Okay? Any questions? So if it's good enough for the casino, it's good enough for me. This should give you a way to generate numbers that are in general fairly uniform. Okay? No obvious bias on that. Any questions? Now, no, uh, okay, let's just leave it at that. Now, sometimes there are good hash functions and sometimes there are bad hash functions. And it's sometimes subtle to see whether something is good or bad. Let me give you an example here. How many people in here know your social security number? Okay. I want you to right now write down on a piece of paper the first three digits of your social security number so you remember it, okay? Does everybody do this? Write down the first three digits of your social security number, okay? I'm not gonna go through to you unless it violates some, some personal, detailed personal thing. Give me the first three digits of your social security number. What is it? 104, what's yours? 446. What's yours? 082. Oh, look, we're scattering things around the possible buckets. That's probably interesting. 138. 039. Okay. 084. 095. 074. 056, are we scattering them around the buckets? Okay. 062. Okay. 115. Next. 063. We actually have a collision. Somebody yell out bang. Okay. 
three through five. Come on, no use. Zero five two. One one five bing, we have a collision, right? Does everybody see that? Do these look like they are randomly scattered around the space of the three digit numbers? No, okay? Now write down your last three digits of your social security number so you remember them. Okay? Let's take a look at the thing. What? Let's come back here. Now let's take a look at this. Okay, hold on a second. Now let's take a look at your last three digits of your social security number. Okay? Same thing. Give me your number. 351. 102. 139. 505. 572. 165. These are the last digits, right? 056. 802. 600. Okay. What? 052. 179. 653. 945. 220. 016. 757. 602. Okay, I think I. Do people believe this is better? This is a better hash function. This is scattered around. Does everybody see that? Now, notice this still look like there's bunching, but it looks a lot less uniform, a lot more uniform, right? Does anybody know why this is? Okay, yeah. The first five digits of your social security number t depend upon where you applied for your card and when you applied for your card. So all of you are, a lot of you are by New Yorkers, and a lot of you are roughly the same age, right? So, so you are mostly concentrated in the New York quadrant. Taking the first three digits would be bad. The last digits, what they then do is basically they just, oh, when your next person in line gets the next number from then on. And so the order in which you applied is basically random. That's why the last digits are good and the first several digits are bad. Okay, any questions here? So if we were gonna try to hash social security numbers, it makes a difference what you do. And it's, there's a certain amount of art and care that has to go on into um, identifying you know, good hash functions. Any questions about that? So it's a little bit mysterious. It's one reason why worst case matters in hash functions. You know, worst, when you talk about hash tables, if you didn't have a good hash function, or an appropriate hash function, you got very unlucky. Ding, you're gonna get a lot of collision. Any questions about that? Okay, so the next thing I want you all to give me your, so your, your credit card numbers, okay? Just, no, that's a joke, no, not for that. Okay, any questions here? So what is the performance of a hash table, hash, a, a um, hash um, function? With all of these operations, constant time expected, for worst case, linear. What about min, max, and successor and predecessor? How would we find the minimum element in a hash table? What would we have to do to find the minimum element in a hash table? We go through all buckets and all the elements in each bucket. Are you better than the best one we've seen so far, right? We don't know where the minimum element is. It could be anywhere in the table, right? Does everybody agree with that? So in fact, the time it takes to, to find them, these operations are order n, which is the number of elements, because we're going to have to look at each element, plus order m, which is the number of buckets. We have a hash table with one element, but n buckets. To find out which bucket contains that one element takes order m. Does everybody agree with that? So hash tables are good if you can, um, what do you call it? You know, if you want to do search, insert, delete, and 
you get your hash functions right and everything works out nicely. Okay? So pragmatically, they're a very good thing. From an algorithm design point of view, we are going to say the best data structure in theory is the balanced binary tree and everything takes log n. Some of you are going to try to cheat on certain homework and exam problems. When I ask you for something that is n log order n, you will say, well, if I use hashing, it should be order n. And I will make sure you don't get credit for that. In the worst case, we, when we analyze in the worst case, hash functions are not good. Hash tables are not good. Okay? But on the other hand, pragmatically, it's good to know that these things exist and they might be the right way to do it in practice. Any questions? We are doing worst case analysis in here. That's why it makes a difference. And usually if you're clever, often if you're clever, you can do what you want to do using hashing in linear time, let's say, more cleverly, so that in the worst case, it will take linear time. That's why, it, that's why we care about this kind of thing. Any questions? Questions about hashing, those kind of things. Okay. What I want to do is to talk about um, now. So, any question about basically hash tables and what hash table data structures are like? You should now know what a hash table is. You should know how it works. You should know why you want to use one in your program. You should know why you don't want to use one in a worst case analysis of an algorithm. Any questions? That said, the basic idea of hashing is amazingly powerful and more powerful than it might appear as just a dictionary thing. So I'd like to talk about some very, very clever applications of hashing just to broaden your horizon. Worst case, all of these are bad. They don't work. We don't care about them, right? But pragmatically, they often work, and they're very, very clever, and they're worth knowing about. Okay, they're worth appreciating why people want to hash sometimes. Any questions? So one question is, let's look at this following algorithm problem. The algorithm problem is a famous problem of pattern matching, string pattern matching. I give you as input a string, let's say the Bible. Um, how does the Bible start? In the beginning. OK, dot, 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 long string, right? And I'm giving you a query string, OK? The string was, let's say, Adam. Is Adam in the Bible? Yes, Adam is there, right? Is Skeena in the Bible? The answer is no, Skeena is not in the Bible, right? So the question is, algorithmically, I give you a string of length n. I give you a pattern of length m. And I want to know, is this string in that, this query string in the big string? OK? How could I do that problem? Someone want to give me an algorithm? for finding if a string exists in a big string. OK? How might one do it? A slow, correct, good, worst case algorithm. How could you test? Give me an algorithm to tell whether a particular string pattern exists in a string. Hash, let's not deal with hash. How do we deal with a simple thing? First of all, word, OK, we'll talk about why we don't like that later, but keep going. Yes. Yes? OK, what you're saying is the following. Here is the text, right? I line up the pattern, which you say is six letters here, M letters. And I explicitly test, are these letters the letters going to Panta S-K-I-E-N-A, right? If it is, we have found it, right? If not, what do we do then? Shift over one. Are you S-K-I-E-N-A? No. Are you S-K-I-E-N-A? Does everybody get the idea? This would be done by how many nested for loops? What would the loops be? Something like. It would go something like 4i equals 1 to n. Every position in the string, right? Then you want to check for j equals 1 to m. Is the, I guess I'd have to get this right, is character text sub i plus j equal to pattern j? Isn't that really what it's actually testing about? 
people see where the indices come from? Is the jth character of the text equal to the starting point plus jth character? Is the jth character of the pattern equal to the starting point plus jth position in the text? Any question? How many people understand this algorithm? Feel they could, they could, you know, they could program it. They understand it, right? What's the running time of this algorithm? Okay, n squared. What about some other bound? M n. Does everybody agree? Skeena is short. The Bible is long, right? You could say it's the Bible squared. But it would be much better to think of it as order n times m, because the pattern might be short, right? Any questions about that? Okay, yes. Well, the worst case, I guess the question is how you're selling this thing. You could say to me, yes, the worst case is n squared. If you get, I have an algorithm that runs an n squared time for doing this. But it's more precise and better salesmanship. I guess to, to say that it's order n, plus n times the pattern length. Because for the pattern length to be, to be interesting, it's got to be less than the text, right? Suppose I told you that I have a, a pattern of size a million. Is it in, in, a, in, a, in a text of size 100? The answer is it can't be, right? So m is u has to be less than or equal to n. So saying m times n is better than saying order n squared, right? This is better. Sounds better, OK? It tells you that when the algorithm is, when m is small, this is going to be pretty fast, right? So I like saying this better than this. It's not clear you're wrong when you're saying n squared. But you wouldn't be wrong saying it's order n cubed either, right? There's always an upper bound, right? For our analysis to be interesting, we want as tight an upper bound as we can get. Any questions? Yes? When m is near the size of n, it is going to be order n squared, right? Well, what does it mean to be near? That's an interesting point. What is the hardest case for this algorithm? If m was equal to n, it's not very hard, right? There's only one place the pattern might be. Where is it hard? It gets hard when, when it's half. Here is your text. And your pattern is of size n, text n over 2. Doesn't that sound like where the hard one case is? If the pattern is of size, let's say, you say n over 2, right? There's n over 2 possible places where it might go. Testing each one of these takes n over 2 time, right? That would be n squared over 4, right? n squared. So. Saying it is order n times m, we're not wrong when we say it's n times m, right? But we hold it, we, but, but it, that's better than saying n squared, because in fact, when the pattern is small, we'll run in n times small number, right? Any questions about that? OK? So this is quadratic in the worst case which is a bummer, OK, in the case over here. Any questions? Let me now show you, uh, show you an algorithm that is linear time in, in the expected case using hashing, OK? And I want you to come out of this with, with two results. One is hashing is cool and hashing is good, but I do not want you to come out and say, yes, I should be doing hashing in my homework. I should be doing hashing in my uh, exam. We are dealing with worst case on the exams unless I tell you otherwise, right? And hashing is, is not going to get you anywhere there. Any questions? So don't let it contaminate your thoughts too much. Be intrigued, but don't be contaminated. Any questions? So how might I use hashing in a clever way to find the um, a uh, the, okay, here's basically what we were just saying. That if we want to search, we could do a brute force search in m times n time, okay, and find the thing. In the worst case, it's n times m. That's what we worked out before, right? 
What is a clever idea about hashing? Here is a question. Suppose I take my string and I take a particular, my pattern is of length m. Suppose I compute the hash code of my string of length n, my pattern of length m. I am going to get it a hash value for that. Does everybody agree with that? If I take a hash function and compute my hash function on my string of length m, my query string, I will get a hash value of x. Does everybody agree with that? What happens if I take a window in my text string that is m characters long, and I compute the hash function of this window of m characters? Suppose the answer to that was not x. What would that mean? What does it mean? That this window of m characters cannot be equal to the pattern. Does everybody agree with that? If the hash code is different, OK, they cannot be the same thing. Does everybody agree with that? How do people see that idea? I'm going to not be writing n divided by m. I'm going to actually do this n times. But let's just think about it. Does everybody follow, let's follow the logic here. Suppose I take, let's say it's the first m characters of the string. I compute the hash code of the first m characters of the string. If that is not x, the first m characters cannot be the same as the pattern. Does everybody agree with that? What if they are the same m characters? As, what, what, if, what if the hash code is the same of the first m characters of the string and the pattern? They might be the same. Are they likely to be the same? Well, hash codes are unusual. Right? We, we sort of expect that the hash code captures a lot about the string. It's not just it might be. Okay, It, it likely is in some sense of likely. Does everybody see that? If my hash code makes it hard, function makes it hard to come up with the same hash value, it likely means it is the same thing. Any questions about how people believe that, right? But I have to actually check to make sure, right? So what is my string processing algorithm here? Something called the Raven Carp algorithm, clever thing. I compute the hash code of the first m character. Are you the same? as the hash code of the query of the pattern? If the answer is no, compute the hash code of the second through n plus first character. Are you the same as the pattern? If no, then I know you're not the same as the pattern, right? Compute the hash code of the third through the n plus second characters. Are you the same? Oop. You are the same as the hash code, right, of the pattern, right? Let me now explicitly check. How much time will it take to explicitly check if this set of m characters is the same as the pattern? m, right? I go, are you the same, you the same, you the same, you the same, right? So let's, do you see that my problem is going to be reducing to I am doing how many hash function evaluations over the string of length n? How many hash function evaluations am I going to do? n minus m. Why n minus m? There's n starting points. I can't start too close to the end of the string, right? If my string is 10 characters long, can I have a match starting at the last position? No, I run out of string, right? So what is this algorithm going to work like? OK. I'm going to do a total of n hash evaluations. I, I compute my hash function in constant time. That's n times a constant, right? Then I pay a cost for checking Did this, if, if they happen to match. I pay a cost for checking, right? And if they happen to by accidentally hit, I pay an N order m cost. But very unlikely, I should have to pay that cost. 
Do people see how my string searching is now reduced to n calls to a hash function? Okay? If I can compute my hash function in constant time, that means it is basically order n time to do this checking. Any questions? Okay. What is the worst case of this algorithm? O of n? No. What is the worst case of this algorithm? I com n times m. Why is that? I compute the hash function here. Bang, there's a collision. OK, let's spend m characters to check. Nah, just joking, they're really different. Go to the second spot, compute the hash code. Bang, there's a collision. You must be the same. I check. Nope, they're not the same. But I'm spending m time to check every single time. Does everybody see that? Does this seem likely that I'm going to get disappointed? If I have a good hash function, I shouldn't be getting so many spurious collisions by chance, right? Does everybody see that? That's the reason why, on average, this should be order n. But if I get these collisions, in the worst case, it's going to be nm. Any questions? There is one bit of magic here that I still haven't described that might be troubling you if you catch on to it. I've lied about one thing so far. Yes. What is it? How does my hash function take constant time? Why should it be a problem for my hash function to take constant time? You're saying, wait, Skeena, you are trying to hash a string of length m. And you're telling me you can hash that in constant time, right? That's what I'm telling you. Don't you have to look at all the m characters in the thing in order to do it? Shouldn't your hash function take order m to evaluate? OK? What if this if it would take order m to evaluate my hash function? What would be the time complexity of this algorithm? n times m. I'm doing n evaluations, each of which took order m. OK? But I'm not really lying. It this is the catch that we're talking about, right? It should take me order m time to evaluate it. But what's interesting is the hash function we like has an interesting property, I don't, which I'll tell you about. But you can work out the algebra later if you want. The question is, if I have the hash function for this string, and I move over by one position, what is changing in the hash function? If I could find a way to delete the character that's no longer in my window, OK, and adds the character in that is now in my window, that's only two characters worth of stuff that I'm doing in the next hash evaluation. You see that? And the claim is if you look at this, this thing, in fact, that property holds. That's the clever thing. So in fact, you can compute the next value after that in constant time. Any questions about that? How many people sort of understand the idea? How many people don't understand the idea? I don't want to hear anything more about it. Any questions? I want to hear more about it. So do you have a question? A question? Or just, I don't understand. You don't understand. Any, any other questions? You don't understand. OK, read the book is going to be my sense. OK, this, this thing is in the book. Maybe it'll be clearer in the book, OK? The important thing here is that there is some magic in the hash code function. The idea that the hash function almost magic, almost certainly tells me whether two strings are the same is the interesting property of the hash function, OK? And from that, you can do all kinds of amazing things. Okay? Any questions? In fact, I once heard a talk by a, a, well, a very famous algorithm, a famous algorithms guy who went into industry, a guy named Udi Manber. He was an algorithms guy like me, smarter, but a guy like me. Okay? Went in, and he, he went to uh, Yahoo and became the chief scientist at Yahoo for a while. He started A9, the Amazon search engine. Now he's at Google. 
Okay? He once gave a talk to the algorithms people. Okay? Someone asked him, what are the algorithms that they care about at Yahoo? What are the algorithms that make Yahoo go? And of course, the algorithms people are busy thinking, oh, I want complicated algorithms to think about. He said that the most important things at Yahoo are hashing, hashing, and hashing. Okay? That hashing is just amazingly useful for lots of things. And let me describe one problem for which it should be clear hashing is a good thing to do. Let's say that you use Yahoo or Google, okay? One thing that you're doing is you're spidering billions of web pages. That's what these guys do for a living, right? They spider billions of web pages. And often on the web, there are two copies of the same document. Does everybody believe that? Has everybody ever come across the same document in two places on the web? Yes, it's obvious it happens, right? As a search engine, do you want to say the most relevant documents for your search are these hundred copies of the exact same document? No, you do not, right? So one thing that Google or Yahoo want to be able to do is to take a look at the web and say, are there any documents that when I spider a new document from the web, I want to know, is it the same as any other document on the web, right? If it is, I don't want to put it in my index. Do people get that idea? Does that make sense? So how should Yahoo tell whether or not their document, a new document they spider, they hit Skeena's web page, is it someplace else on the web? How should Yahoo do it? Hashing. What does hashing mean? How do they hash it? What should they do? OK, any ideas? Word count, well, you can take a look at it and say from the word count, this document has 96 words in it. Maybe I'll compare this document to all the other documents on the web with 96 words on it. Well, how many documents are there on the web with 96 words on it? A billion, OK? If I have to compare my new document against every one of these billion, that's a bad thing, right? That would take forever. What if I take a good hash function that returns a big number between, let's say, a 128-bit number? That's a good number, right? 2 to the 100 is a very big thing. There's not 228 atoms to the universe, right? There's not 2 to the 128 atoms in the universe. There's not that many atoms. There's not that many documents on the web, right? If I use a hash function, that returns a number that big, and it's a good hash function, it is unlikely that two documents that are not the same will hash to the same thing. Do you agree with that? So what should Yahoo do? They should maintain a table, a table of all the a hash codes of every document on the web, right? Then when they spider something, they say, hash code of this new document, are you on do we have a document already with this hash code? If so, what they should now do is to compare it against all the documents in that bucket, which are relatively few, and say, is it the same, right? Or if they trust the hash function enough, they should say, forget it, it's a duplicate, okay? Probably is a duplicate, okay? Any questions about that? Do people see how you couldn't search for documents on the web by comparing every pair? because that would be ridiculously prohibitive, OK? But the hashing solution is neat and beautiful. Any questions about that? This is one that if you don't get it, a question like explain it again, I'd like to see it then. You see how by using hash codes, we can find all the duplicates on the web in basically time linear in the of the documents that we have. Yes? OK, so hashing is good because it is linear, OK? Because the way that we are going to do it, how would we find all the duplicates on the web? Now the problem of finding all the duplicates on the web, we take all the documents on the web once, hash them. We get a bunch of web codes. Let's go back here a little bit. We get a bunch of web codes, of, of hash codes. Whenever we see two items with the same hash code, they are likely duplicates. And if they are not, they are likely not duplicates. And so we should spread all the documents out into buckets. 
So to each bucket is small unless they are duplicates. And if they are duplicates, we can discard them. Any questions about that? Yes. Where am I comparing the two documents? Well, if I care, so, so it depends. Is this an incremental or a global thing? So you're saying to me, ultimately, how do I find which are the duplicates? Once I have built this hash table, we agree that if there are two duplicates, they sit in the same bucket, right? To test if this and this are the same, are, are duplicates, I have to actually compare the files together, right? And if it's almost certainly the case that they are duplicates, because to get into the hash bucket, it would be very unlikely unless they were duplicates. Almost always when I explicitly compare them, I will say, yep, they're a duplicate, right? And that makes it then easy to identify all duplicates, OK? Any questions about it? Because they quickly limit my attention to where the duplicates are, OK? Instead of having to compare everything against everything else, right? Any questions here? So hashing is a good thing, OK? Any questions about it? That said, we don't care about it for the rest of the class. But keep it in mind because it's a good thing. Any questions? OK. What I'd like to do for the rest of class is tell you about another good thing, OK? Another good thing that you know about or think you know about, OK? I think you've heard a zillion times. It has to do with sorting algorithms. How many people have had three classes so far where they discussed sorting algorithms? OK? Of most of you. How many have had four classes so far? Well, maybe if you repeated some of the classes a couple of times, maybe. OK, you probably saw sorting in your, your 110, right? The introduction to computing, they probably talked about it. You probably saw it in 114 when they started talking about programming. You probably saw it in data structures when they talked about different things. So sorting is something that computer science people like to talk about. And um, why do we talk about it? OK, there are lots of good reasons to talk about it. Um, for the purposes of this class, there are two primary reasons why we're going to be talking about them. Actually, let's say, let's say, let's say actually three reasons, and maybe not even the three reasons that we're on here. The one reason why we will talk about sorting algorithms and many, many different sorting algorithms is that many of the ideas that come up in the algorithm design, there is a sorting algorithm that somehow illustrates that idea. So as an algorithm person, I have a small number of tricks at my disposal. I have divide and conquer at my disposal. I have randomization. Okay? I have data structures. I have a certain number of tricks that I have. And the interesting thing about sorting is, is for almost every algorithm design paradigm, there is a way to sort using that idea. One reason why I like it is that there's lots of ideas to talk about. Okay? A lot of interesting ideas to talk about. Maybe the most interesting book in computer science I have ever read is a book by Knuth, volume three, on sorting. This is about 700 pages on different sorting algorithms. And this is really, to honestly, one of the most interesting books that you can read, okay? Because there's a lot of intricate ideas and analysis there that is really very clever and interesting. I don't know if you believe me, Matt, but that's true. The other reason, though, why we're going to talk about sorting a lot Okay, is that it is just a very useful thing to do. Okay, you, there's always a statistic cited that 25% of all mainframe computer processing cycles are spent sorting. Okay, you may say, well, I don't program mainframes. That's COBOL, that's boring. There's still a lot of stuff that is done that involves sorting. And in fact, algorithmically, what I want to convince you of for the rest of the class, I'm not going to talk about any sorting algorithm. But I want to convince you why sorting is a useful thing to sort to know about. Because a lot of algorithm problems become easy once you have sorted them, something. OK? Again, what I would like to point out here is that in sorting, as you go in over, as you've taken a lot of classes, there are n log n sorting algorithms. We proved we came up with n log n sorting algorithms in the problem of the day, three of them. We're going to see more or so in the next class or two. 
The naive algorithms for sorting, the selection sort, or the insertion sort, or the bubble sort, these things took n squared, or maybe n squared over 4 on average, something like that. If you compare as n gets larger, the number of steps between an n log n algorithm and an n squared algorithm, you fairly quickly hit the wall where the n squared algorithm becomes impossible. If we lived in a world where sorting took n squared time, you could imagine an alternate universe in time and space where they do not have n log n sorting algorithms. It would be amazing what else they do not have in that world. They do not have large libraries. Why do you not have a large library if you do not have can sort efficiently? What good is a large library if you do not have a, a card catalog? Does everybody agree with that? There is no way to look up the book. You don't need it. You can't have a large library. Large libraries become unwieldy if you couldn't sort. You can't do a, a census of the United States if you can't sort everybody's sort everybody. Or you can't do any data processing because for once n gets too large, n squared won't cut it. Okay. So if we didn't live in a world of n log n sorting algorithms, we would live in a primitive and world okay any questions here so you should wake up tonight think you know think how lucky you are that there are n log n sorting algorithms any questions okay let me now prove that to you though because the uh, the interesting thing about sort the thing that the single thing algorithmically that's most important about sorting is learning to use sorting as a data structure as an initial step as a black box to solve other for, OK? So let's go through some of these applications, because once you learn to think about using sorting, it's very, very easy to design efficient algorithms for things that otherwise wouldn't be possible or would be very hard to do. So the problem is we have a, a large set of things we would like. To, we have our, our card catalog. How can we organize our card catalog? so we can efficiently look up a book in the library. How do we do it? Well, if our initial step is to sort the books in alphabetical order, now how do you do it? What? You sort the books, OK? In n log n time, you can take n books and you can sort them, right? Sort the titles of the books. Now then, how can you quickly tell whether or not one of those books is in the library to search for a particular book? How do we do it? Binary search, right? Does everybody see that binary search will give us what we want in log n time? But it only makes sense if the data is sorted, right? Does everybody agree with that? What if, the data, what if I give you a book that is not sorted and you do binary search on it? I say a telephone book, I ask you to do binary search on the um, phone numbers. You could actually do it. You could go to the middle of the book, look at the phone number. Am I begin it before or after it, right? It will run in log n time, right? So when you stop, what's the only problem? It won't stop with the answer of whether you found the phone number, right? So recognize the power of sorting is that it enabled us to do searching quickly. OK? Sorting is powerful. Any questions? Look at another problem. Suppose I give you a bunch of numbers. Let's say 17, 96, 42, uh, 21, 38. And I want to find out which pair of numbers is closest to each other. Which is the pair of numbers which is smallest difference, OK? Why might you want to solve this problem? Can anyone imagine a, an application where you have a bunch of numbers or a bunch of things, and you want to find which two things are closest? Any ideas? Yes. Carpooling, OK? So one possibility is you're saying that uh, Let's say that um, what you're saying, I think, is, 
Suppose everybody lived on the Long Island Expressway, right? And everybody commutes to the city. Both rough approximations of reality, right? You want to figure out, you have a bunch of people here, and you want to figure out, I want to create one carpool that will make two people happiest. Which two people will be happiest to be in a carpool? The closest fare. Does everybody agree with that? So if I have to create one carpool, which is the best carpool to create? The two that are closest to each other. Okay, I think I believe that one. Any other kinds of applications for why you... What? Excuse me, what? By age, okay? So one question might be, if you have a bunch of people and they have different ages, and you want to find out what couple could be formed that is closest in age, that would be a closest pair problem. They're finding one couple to make from this so that they're closest in age, right? Any other applications of closest pair, okay? How could we find out which pair of items are closest? Okay. What is the non-sorting? We live in this alternate universe where there is no sorting. How do we find out which, which pair is closest? Try all pairs. Does everybody agree with that? I say person I, I, I goes from one to N, J goes from one to N. I and J, okay, is S sub I e how far is S sub I from S sub J? If it's a close pair, keep it, right? That would be order N squared, right? What would be a way to solve closest pair in a world where we do have sorting? What is the right first thing to do to those N items? Sort them. Now what is interesting once we sort them? 17, 21, 38, 42, 96. What is interesting now? Now we linearly sort, who is the closest person to this person? It had better be here, right? Who is the closest person to this person? Either the one before it or the one after it. Does everybody agree? Once it's sorted, closest pair can be solved in linear time, right? For each element, look at the one before it, look at the one after it. Which which is the smaller of those two? Is that the smallest one I've ever seen? Right? Does everybody see that? The time to find closest pair is order n log n for sorting plus order n. What does that work out to big O wise? n log n, right? So we can find the closest pair in n log n time. Any question about it? Question. Well, if I look at every possible pair, there are n things. Well, let's think about it. Let's, let's, let's take a look at it. Suppose I have 10 people here. How many pairs of 10 people are there? About. I claim that for every one of these people, there's 10 other people that it could be paired with. Does everybody agree with that? Or nine people that could it be paired with? Does everybody agree with that? If we look at how many pairs? This is too complicated for me. What is clear to me is that for any particular person, the number of pairs that person can be in is n. Does everybody agree with that? If there are n people in this crowd, I want to think how many pairs are there? Well, how many pairs can there be with Skeena? You say n minus 1, n minus 1 is the same as n to me, right? How many people are there like Skeena in the group? No, there's only one person like Skeena, not n. But there's n people in the group, right? n times n is n squared. Does everybody agree with that? OK. So that's why I say it's n squared. n factorial counts the number of ordering, the number of arrangements of things. And so n, n factorial means arranging all the n in a particular order. The number of pairs is n squared. How many triples are there? n cubed. Actually, I guess, in, in, in fact, the number of pairs that you get, it, how many k-tuples are there? You learned in combinatorics that there are n choose k committees or groups of k things you can make out of n, right? 
So that may be why your head is thinking about n factorial. But what is n to k, n use k? It is actually big O of n to the k. Okay? So that's why that's why I think of it that way. Any questions about that? So closest pair can be done in linear n log n time once we know about sorting. Any questions? Look at another example. Element uniqueness. This is like the problem Yahoo was trying to solve. Okay? Given a set of n things, how we want to tell are they all unique or are there any duplicates? Okay? I look at your papers in here. Okay? You guys are all submitting copies of the an exam to me. Okay? I want to know if two of you copied off of each other, right? If you copied off of each other, you have the exact same exam, right? How could I tell among the N people here? Are there any two with exactly the same exam? What if I want to do it in N squared? How do I do it? I take your exam. To every pair of people, I take your exams. I hold them up to the light. Are they the same? Okay, that would be N squared. That would be hard for me, right? How could I solve this problem in N log N time? What's the first thing to do? Sort. What do I sort the items? If I sort the exams in alphabetical order, by content, not by author, right? What would I then do? How would I identify if there was a duplicate? What would happen if there was a duplicate? What? The neighbor. If you are the, if, if there are two exams that have the same contents, well, darn it, they're going to be neighbors in sorted order, right? Does everybody agree with that? And now I can just check. Are you the same as the guy after you? The guy after you, the guy after you, the guy after you, guy after you, ding, ding, ding. Okay? There is a duplicate. Okay? Any questions about that? Do people see how I can do duplicate detection? How much time did it take? I have elements. How much time does it take to do duplicate detection? Okay, is there a duplicate among the pair? How would I have done this? What was my operation? Step one, sort n log n. Step two, what did I do? What? Do the sweeping, comparing the pairs in sorted order, right? How many pairs are there between it and the guy after it? N. N log N plus O of N. Total time N log N. Okay? Any questions about that? Any questions? Okay? I'll go through, I think, let me, let me just take a look at this, see what I've got next. Hold on a second. Okay, here's another example, just because it's the same one. What if I want to tell, actually, what did I say before? Rare, I see. This was element uniqueness. This is what I was doing there. Any questions? Okay. Next class, we'll talk about a few more applications of this, okay, of sorting, before we get into details about sorting algorithms. But remember, sorting is your friend. That is the point here. Okay. Any questions? Okay, thanks for your attention. Give me your days, the daily problems, and I'll see you guys next class.